Hello and welcome. While the front lines are fairly stable, except for Bakhmut, we have interesting in additional information about a potential Ukrainian amphibious operation over the Dnipro and some accusations of a coming chemical attack. This and more in the Situation Report. Unfortunately, in the last Situation Report from Monday, uh, from Saturday, the audio didn't work again. I have no idea why, but um, unfortunately, my software occasionally seems to be intended to intending to sabotage me. So I'm sorry for that. This time, at least it does work. I checked. When we come to the developments on the front line north of the Sivieski Donetsk, so mostly in Luhansk, but also a little bit in Kharkiv, we have reports of attacks um, around Vorichna in Kuzimivka and Novoselivske. There is fighting. There is some fighting close to Makivka, and we have reports of attacks in the direction of Terny and Torske, as well as southwest of Krimina, Kuzmyne, south of it, and here in the forest, there are some attacks. The Russians might have gained some ground within the within the forest. Other than that, the front line seems to be unchanged over the last few days. There's also reports of attacks in the direction of Vyechno Kamianske. Here, I have no reports of them being successful in any regard. Other than that, further south, closer to Bakhmut, reports of attacks in, in the direction or in Orihovne. Kovo Vasilivka and in the direction of Bodanivka. In both cases, I have no reports that those attacks have had any success. So they are probably they probably have been repulsed. Inside of Bakhmut, it's somewhat different though. The Russians are advancing both in the north as well as in the east of the front line, which is now the center of Bakhmut itself, as well as in the south. There's unconfirmed, it's it's still not confirmed whether the the stadium here is occupied yet, but they have definitely advanced and they have crossed the railway line by now as well. So the hold of Ukrainian forces of Bakhmut city is down to less than 25%, probably more to 20% as of now, but they are still holding and the lines of communication are more or less open, even though there are some reports that the, the, um, uh, the dirt roads crossing between the northern road of Romove as well as the southern road, uh, the T0504 that's both going here as well as has some connection here. The dirt roads are probably close to being impassable because of the Rasputitsa right now, but supplies are still reaching the forces that are in Bakhmut. The Russians are trying to change this, but um, the fighting around south of Ivanivske has been unsuccessful. There have been Ukrainian counterattacks as well as Russian attacks. The front line seems to not have changed. Colonel Cherevati, the speaker of the Eastern Command, is saying the Russian VDV, so the air assault units, are now fighting in Bakhmut itself. We've already heard in the past that they were in, this, in the location, but they have not engaged in fighting. Apparently, inside of Bakhmut, this has changed now. The VDV is generally considered to be an elite force, but it has been filled up with mobilized personnel so how much of an elite it can still be considered now is a totally different story um, there are also reports of attacks from from klishivka in the direction of pret pret Teshine. Basically, uh, Preteshine and Chaziv Yar in that direction here to cut the TO504 there. They have not been successful and there have also been attacks west of Andrivka in the direction of Biloho Bilahora. The Russians have crossed the canal here and tried to advance further west but have been unsuccessful at least over the last few days. According to Ukrainian sources, the fighting around Avdivka has is has not died down, but has lost in intensity as well as in the number of attacks. So the Russian forces are attacking less as of now, but they are still attacking. It seems though that they already run out of steam. The last 10 to 14 days were heavy attacks on Avdivka, but the units are either spent or uh, the Russians have not decided to commit them again to the fighting because the, the amount of attacks are going down. The, um, there are still attacks 
in the direction of Novo Kalinove. I have not read about any attacks further in the direction of Stepove. The fighting at the outskirts of Avdivka itself seem to be more or less positional, so no real serious attacks anymore. There are some attacks in the direction of Siverne and Pervomaiske. I cannot confirm that they have had any su success though. In Marinka and Pobieda there are reports of Russian attacks. The majority of the attacks apparently on the whole front line is supposedly happening at Marinka right now, but they have not achieved their goal of pushing the Ukrainians out. The Russians are trying a turning maneuver for a while now and the fighting has now is now in the two forests north and south of the city but uh, as of now they have not achieved their goal yet. I have no reports about fighting in the rest of Don Donetsk uh, Oblast so Vuledar apparently no serious ground fighting at all. On the southern front, we have some reports about recon attacks, reconnaissance enforced by the Ukrainians here on the Saporizhia front. The Russians are claiming they are with mechanized forces, main battle tanks, as well as IFVs. But I have no reports that uh, e e neither have I seen proof that the Ukrainians have suffered serious losses, nor do I have I seen any proof that the, those attacks have actually achieved anything. So they seem to have been reconnaissance attacks to just find out where the Russian strong points are where the Russian positions are. At Riba, the um, pro-Russian telegram channel, which is very professional but clearly pro-Russian, uh, is saying that the Ukrainians have kept up the impression of a coming offensive over the Dnipro over the last few days. So they kept the the appearance that they are about to launch an amphibious operation over the Dnipro. Overall, that seems highly unlikely. Uh, a command raid is one thing, but should they manage to cross the river successfully, they would be stuck in a, a in a small bridgehead without heavy weapons, which then has to be brought over a river several hundred meters wide, fully in range of Russian artillery and of Russian recon elements. That the so the the Ukrainians would have to push out of that bridgehead to extend it to a degree that the Russian artillery can no longer reach the, the supply lines over the river. And that seems extremely unlikely at this position. Now, this might happen. An amphibious operation might happen. It might be successful to a certain degree if the Russians are preoccupied at another position. So if the offensive starts, that is to expect it to, to happen in southern Saporizhia towards the Azov Sea, and it achieves some success, so the Russians start diverting all their reserves in that direction and this this front line is weakened then of course we might see something in this regard or it might be a diversionary attack not even aimed at a successful uh, extension of a bridge at just, just to force russian reserves to rush towards the dnipro to then open up a gate here any in in any of those circumstances an offensive over the dnipro might make sense but only in those that it itself without support on other front lines can achieve a breakthrough seems extremely unlikely likely. Still though, that is um, supposedly not everything that happens in amphibious operation. There is now a report that in last fall, I think it was in October, the Ukrainians actually supposedly did an, an amphibious invasion over the, the Dnipro towards the Saporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, the reports at that time, we got reports from the Russians and but there were were no image there was no image proof whatsoever that that supported it the only thing that happened was a video spread by russian telegram channels of victims by of of killed ukrainian soldiers which then two days later a second video appeared which fall which didn't cut off where the first one did but the few seconds later a command goes and all the supposed corpses rise up and are well and alive so it all felt like the ukrainians trolled the the pro-russian military bloggers with a fake video but it seems now apparently that inv invasion actually happened supposedly 600 ukrainian soldiers more or less a battalion with three uh, it's called armored boats try to cross the reservoir to capture the Saporizhia nuclear power plant. I am not completely sure this is actually true now, but supposedly it's Ukrainian sources confirming that. Uh, they, they supposedly claimed that they expected the Russians to only use infantry as they would be too afraid to damage the nuclear power plant if they use heavy weapons, but the amphibious operation ran into artillery fire and into into uh, it got shot at by main battle tanks and while a small force still made it over the river and landed that force was destroyed so 
that's basically confirming the Russian propaganda from half a year ago. Whether that's actually true now, it's possible, but uh, we don't know much more than that. At least it's, it feels like uh, there might actually have been some truth to that. Um, according to the Telegraph, who reported on that, uh, it's coming from Ukrainian sources confirming that. Still, though, um, I have not seen the proof yet. So, uh, and I have outside of the Telegraph, I have not found anyone reporting of this who doesn't doesn't reference the Telegraph. So it might be that uh, there is a mistake, that a mistake happened um, there. Anyways, um, we also have reports now about the Russian campaign against the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. It made no sense from the beginning that uh, as a terror bombardment would not break the Ukrainian will to fight. Uh, it would have been close to the first time that a terror bombardment from the air would, would solve it. And past bombardments have been far stronger than what the Russians did there with, uh, with even less success. So um, the only military value of taking out electric, electric infrastructure would be to hamper the production of uh, war material. But that is mostly happening outside of Ukraine anyways. Ukraine has removed uh, parts of its factories to Poland, for instance, to produce there. So bombing the infrastructure always felt like it's more meant towards the domestic audience in Russia, showing that, yeah, the, the Ukrainians are freezing now, they don't have electricity, so we are winning the war. It felt at least like this. And now we have the reports that it was useless. According to this, Ukraine is now resuming electricity exports. So basically, they recovered their whole um, network. The attacks by the Russians were mostly aimed at um, substations, so not at the power plants itself. And obviously, a leveled power plant will not be repaired in three weeks, but substations can be repaired fairly fast. Um, they, are, they have a high effect. They immediately turn off the electric grid if they are hit, but they can be repaired fairly fast, and that seems to have been the case. So the whole campaign that Russia did seems to have been uh, useless in in regards to its strategic effect except if you expect the goal the real goal was to expand ukrainian air defense systems but then there would have probably been more attractive targets than this regardless um we have an interesting other story it's coming from the ministry of defense of russia that now this is important that it's the russian side that is saying this but they claim the ukrainians are taking let me scroll down so you can pause the video and read it if you want to um the, they claim the ukrainians are taking corpses out of morgues close to sumi and place them into fake positions, fake fighting positions they've established towards the Russian side. And then they will claim that a chemical weapon attack happened on those units uh, as they are already corpses. So the Ukrainians will prepare everything to look like it was a real chemical attack. Uh, I've read Western commentary and they claim that this is preparation for a Russian false flag attack or something like this, which doesn't make much sense. Because to do a chemical attack at Sumi would only make sense if this um if there is a follow-up attack on the ground and we have no information that the russians are anywhere close to having the forces uh, let alone at sumi to do open another front they have more or less everything they have available already on the front line here so there simply isn't anyone to exploit a potential weakening of the front line if they were willing to use chemical weapons it would make much more sense somewhere along the front line here to achieve a breakthrough maybe whatever on ivanivske and um and bodan to cut off Bakhmut. That would make sense if the Russians were using chemical weapons there and if they want to create a false flag attack to justify an own usage of chemical weapons like the Ukrainians did it first so we can do it now as well. Why would they then uh, use it against Ukrainian corpses? That doesn't make any sense. So if they are willing to do a false flag attack, wouldn't they just sacrifice a few own personnel or use their own uh, uh, soldiers that have died, their own corpses in this? So in this regard, the explanations don't make much sense to me. Now I'm going to anger my massively pro-Ukrainian uh, viewership, but if you are a, a loyal follower of this video channel, you know that I try to be as objective. If we look at the th at the possibility that the Ukraine that the Russians might for once be right because let there be no doubt when it comes to lying the Russians so far seem to be the clear winner in this war but now let's imagine the Ukrainians would do that 
Ukrainians would take some corpses, get, gain, produce some small amounts of chemical weapons to, to, to spread around the corpses. And they managed to do this without Western intelligence finding out, without being caught in the act. Uh, the outcry of Russians using chemical weapons would be massive. Uh, it's likely that the Western support for Ukraine would rise because now the Russians, the criminal Russians, are even using chemical weapons. So we need to send even more to Ukraine. And there have been uh, second level claims from you, from the American side, the US side, should Russia use, use nuclear weapons, then there would be a convent, conventional um, strike against Russian forces. Now, everything I read about this was always from former uh, decision makers. So it was uh, Ben Hodges, General Ben Hodges, which who is retired. It was um, the former CIA head and former four-star General Petraeus who said something like this. I've not heard anything from an official government of, of the U.S. government, but it seems likely that this is somewhat within the U.S. plans to do to react to the case of a tactical nuke that they would, for instance, strike Russian the the Black Sea's fleet, or that they would that they would strike conventional forces as a retaliation now chemical weapons aren't a tactical nuke but they are still weapons of mass destruction so should ukraine be able to fake a chemical weapon attack uh, and should it be able to fake it without western intelligence finding out because i can guarantee you the us are not um keen to be dragged into that war for a f um, for a fake a uh, false flag attack for a f due to a false flag attack. If the US wanted to get involved in the Ukraine war, they would already have found a reason to do so. So should the Ukrainians succeed in fooling the Western, uh, their Western allies, the, the benefit would be massive for Ukraine. Uh, they are fairly successful in keeping things uh, secret in regards to the leaked documents that were out in the last few days. I'm still researching there, so I haven't made a video specifically about it yet because I feel I can't contribute anything deeper yet. But one of the arguments there was we usually have more knowledge about the Russian plans than about the Ukrainian plans because the Ukrainians are very tight-lipped in out of fear for traitors and leaks. So supposedly the Ukrainians are, have been fairly successful in keeping plans secret even from their Western allies. Should Ukraine, so should Ukraine fake a, a chemical weapon attack, uh, the, the benefit would be clearly on the Ukrainian side. That explicitly doesn't mean the Ukrainians planned one. That doesn't mean if a chemical attack happens that has to be Ukraine. I'm not accusing Ukraine of having done that. But if we look at the story, it doesn't make sense for the Russian side. It doesn't make sense that the Russians claim the Ukrainians want to bombard their own their own units in Sumy. If they said in 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 um, Bakhmut, that would be a different story. But Sumy doesn't make any sense. Uh, if they want a false flag attack, attack to have a, uh, to to so so them saying it was the Ukrainians makes sense if they want to do something if they actually want to do a chemical attack on Ukrainian position. That would make sense about, around Bakhmut. If they want a justification for using chemical weapons, the false flag attack would have to hit their own side to accuse the Ukrainians to actually and actively having used chemical weapons against Russian forces. Nothing of that is in the information that is given to us by in the, in the claims by the Russian Ministry of Defense. And I don't see in the interpretations of that, I don't see anything like this. So for me, Unless the Kremlin is just doing a general information uh, piece here, which uh, a part of their informational warfare, which is quite possible, unless that is there is at least the tiny op uh, possibility that it might have been a Ukrainian false flag attack that was at least somewhat in the planning, or it might just have been discussed. Like it's not like that doesn't mean that Salushny and Zelensky uh, had discussed and decided on this. Uh, they might have just. Uh, intercepted a, a phone call between two low-grade officers or something like this. But if we look at the, the cost-benefit, I don't see any in this particular scenario with Sumi for the Russian side, but I would see some with the Ukrainian side. Um, just my interpretation about this, which will obviously make a few people unhappy here, because I know that some people expect me to be a Ukraine propagandist and basically not even talk about things negative to Ukraine, but I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure they are... It, 
it feels like the majority of the other channels are like this so um feel feel free to look for those but if you uh, if you appreciate me trying to be objective despite having clear sympathies for the ukrainian side then i would like to invite you to subscribe to the channel hit the bell icon so you don't miss future videos to help me support this channel and help it grow but let's go back to the other things I have. We have an information here from the Ukrainian side, according to which the Russians now have 113 BTGs, battalion tactical groups, in Saporizhia and 204 in Donetsk. From my understanding, that would mean the 113 are more or less along the whole line here, including Kherson, including the Dnipro line, and the 205 should not just be Donetsk. It should definitely be up to the Russian border, which is barely here in, in um, Kharkiv Oblast, this here is Kharkiv Oblast, the rest here is Luhansk. So um, this is the, the force composition. We have this report here by the Ukrainian side. Other than that, um, when it comes to mobilization, we have reports from Russian human rights uh, activists that uh, prisoners that are being recruited no longer get six month contract. Now they get 18 months contract, which makes perfect sense. We have reports about an increasing number of Wagner mercenaries or Wagner convicts that have been released with a full pardon. That's not in the interest of the Russian government. Uh, a criminal, a several time murderer, you don't want him on the street again. If you use him for this, hope you basically hope that he fights as long as possible. And on the last day of his contract, he falls dead. So you don't have to ha face the, the outcry in the public why you release a prisoner, uh, a, a convict, a several times murderer, a rapist or whatever you, you recruited in this regard. Now, by extending the range from six months to 18 months, you not only have him much longer available, you also decrease the likelihood of him leaving the service alive and it so and as russia prepares for an extended war it makes perfect sense that they extend the recruitment range from six months to a more realistic phase how long the war will take this also fits in the accusations or the, in the reports we had in the past that russian uh, the fsb is threatening with uh, is helping the russian ministry of defense in threatening prisoners uh, no, you have to understand that in Russian prison culture, a certain caste, and you have to call it a caste system because you're not, you cannot leave this caste anymore, is basically designed to be raped. Everyone who interacts with them except for the rape is becoming one of those castes. So if you're friendly, if you sit with the, the rape victim on the same table, you are becoming one of them. Uh, you're being designated like this. So being threatened to be close to them is a, a real problem for Russian prisoners. And according to the reports we had here in the past, the, the Russian government was threatening prisoners to put them in the cell blocks together with the rape victims to basically threaten them to become rape victims themselves. And obviously somebody who has 10 years of prison ahead and feeling, feeling that he might have 10 years of getting raped ahead of him or in alternatives, sign a contract and even get the chance of freedom that is a good motivation to to sign a contract this in regards to the other circumstances makes sense that the russian ministry of defense feels free to extend the the service to 18 months which obviously will uh, will be understood by the prisoners as well that their chance of escape escaping their chance of surviving this will be lower in 18 months than it is in six months but it fits in this overall context and there's a report from ukraine that a russian so officer of 15 years has switched site sides to the ukrainian side and wants to set up a siberian battalion now of asiatic russians to fight for the ukrainian side now we have had reports about the russian volunteers fighting on ukrainian side i've never seen proof that they are actually of a sizable force uh, we have reports about chechens fighting for the ukrainians we have reports about the belarusians fighting for ukraine all of those are reports so it seems within the realm of possibility how big that unit will be is a whole different story though but re in regards to past reports to which the russians according to which the russians are more or less expanding ethnic minorities and focusing trying to focus the 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 recruitment and the losses on ethnic minorities to save ethnic russians from the from the consequences of the war in this context it it, it was just a question of time until the, the ethnic minorities loyalty towards Moscow is starting to diminish. I made a video about this, which is on this channel as well. Uh, next thing is kind of funny, 
but um, a, a Duma deputy is now has drafted a bill that would design feminism as an extremist ideology. Now, I obviously have no idea how you want to determine it and what degree of feminism, um, whether you, you take the third wave of feminism or whether the pure fact that women are not the property of men and should be allowed a vote uh, is obviously a wide range of possibilities. But he mentions that um, on the Ukrainian side, feminists are fighting uh, women are fighting and the majority of the feminists are for the Ukrainian side. So according to him, feminism is an extremist organized uh, extremist ideology. We have reports when it comes to international support of the British AS-90 self-propelled artillery being in Ukraine in usage already. There, uh, a bigger number of those were donated to Ukraine by the British government in context of the donation of Challenger 2 main battle tanks. And we have a report here from the Visegrad 24 channel, according to which more than 100 BMP-1, which are massively obsolete, but still better than nothing, um, are being donated by Poland to Ukraine. I have checked if I find it confirmed anywhere, and I didn't. Uh, the, only, the only references to this I found were mentioning this specific post, so, while this post doesn't show any sources. So, um, and I've seen Visegrad in the past doing claims that weren't 100% correct. So it's a slight possibility that this is not true. I didn't find at least uh, confirmation of this, but it's well within the realm of possibility as Poland is trying is is planning to get rid of, rid of its BMP ones, and Poland is highly invested in keeping Ukraine inside of the war and keep giving Ukraine the chance to win this war. I just wanted to say that um, I I can't confirm the whether this specific message is actually true. And finally, we have an interesting video here that's showing Ukrainian jets operating from a road you see a Sukhoi 25 here starting on a regular road here that is just a straight patch and here you see a MiG-29 starting that obviously shows that for the Ukrainian side airports are not essential and not everything they need uh, so taking out the the airstrips the Ukrainian armed forces are using will, is much more difficult for the Russians uh, as the Ukrainian forces just use regular roads for the air operations as well. That's it already it from me for now. If you enjoyed this, con uh, this content, please hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment with what you think. What do you think about the um, false flag attack? Um, anything you write there, any discussion really helps with the algorithm. So if you wanna um, ask me on which side I'm on, like I sometimes see the comments, feel free to do so. It really helps with the channel. But as said, if you really enjoy it, my my attempts my honest attempts to stay objective which means that i also mention ukrainian war crimes etc all of this um, then i would really appreciate a subscription to the channel and a um, hitting the bell icon as said in the past uh, war crimes are fairly normal inside of wars the big difference is how many are being committed and how do the governments react and from the ukrainian side we clearly see far less uh, war crimes being committed and the ukrainian government at least gives lip service to prosecuting them even though i'm still waiting for any proof whatsoever that the prosecution has actually happened but at least they claim they do on the russian side um, they either claim that the war crimes didn't happen or that they were perpetrated by ukrainians using russian uniforms I have yet to see a Russian site, an official site, either the president's office or the, his speaker or the Ministry of Defense admitting that their own soldiers committed war crimes. They might have done so, but I have just missed it. But from my observation so far is that the Ukrainians at least claim that they care about war crimes on, in their own so, on their own side, whereas the Russians act like they don't even exist. And that obviously makes a massive difference, but that doesn't change that the Ukrainian side commits crimes too, and which shouldn't be much of a surprise. Hundreds of thousands of men in, in fighting, in, in combat, in, in war, in, in, in the high psychological stress, some of them have lost family members, um, that some of them commit crimes if they have an opportunity for that shouldn't be much of a surprise with even a rudimentary knowledge of the human nature. Regardless of this, this channel is only possible because of the support from viewers like you. So if you like to support the channel, you can do so by the description, by the means in the description. Thank you very much to everyone already supporting the channel. And that's it from me for now. Thank you for watching and I'll be back.